Here we are, 4 o'clock, folks, downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston, your host on Where the Road Leads, Think Tech Hawaii. And the noise in the background is some other thing going on here. It isn't part of our show. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, welcome our audience and welcome our guests today. Right out of Central Casting, we have Bruce Parks, who represents Northern California in uh, Mailmas. Is that what you're here for? Yeah, <laughs> yeah think, okay. something like that. Okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. And, uh, Ray Suchiyama from right down the street in um, uh, uh, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center, That's actually right. being more serious. These two guys are here on this show for one reason. They both represent organizations that have the most unpronounceable acronyms <laughs> ever invented. NDPTC for the National Disaster Preparedness That's Training right. Center, right, right there. Right That's, there. He has it written down yes. so you can look in the mirror and figure out what it is. And Bruce represents... Bruce. Silicon Valley Association of Unmanned Vehicles. Uh, the, the Silicon Valley Association is, is one that is focused primarily on the development of um, small commercialized uh, drone systems. Drones. Now, that's an unusual topic for this table. <laughs> we probably talk about it three of the four times a month that we have a show here. Normally, we have equipment on the table. We have pictures on the, on the, on the monitor or something like that. We don't have that today because of the pace of activities this week. But uh, the, uh, the uh, Association of Unmanned Aerial Vehicles. Aerial Vehicles, systems, AUVSI. AUVSI, Association of Unmanned Vehicle Systems International. International. Right. AUVSI, NDPTC. Gentlemen, right. meet. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. We'll uh, make this yeah, simple. Yeah, yeah. All right, to make this, and this is actually, you guys bookend the whole game of unmanned systems. On the, on the one hand, we have AUVSI, which represents the manufacturers and academia and such as we go forward in, in design development. And then Ray, on the other end, at NDPTC, represents the high-end user here, which is the folks involved in public safety, disaster operations, disaster preparedness, which is what we really all ought to be thinking about. So we, between the two, we have the high-end user needs, and we have the supply side and the understanding and analysis side represented in, in Bruce. So we have the whole business captured here at this table. Try to cover the spectrum. We've got the spectrum covered. Okay, and, and by the way, we're going to a public Service announcement on behalf of the FAA later. FAA is missing from this table. We'll try to get them here at some point in time. But as you know, uh, and, and, and by the way, I'm breaking the rule that even uh, Azuri won't uh, let me get by with, which is the monologue rule, the no monologue rule we have. And anyway, uh, uh, there's been a lot of activity in the FAA, as we all know, and uh, we're going to use this show to bring forth information from them to anybody who might be watching that has an app, has an application in place or has an exemption. So the reason we're here, this week we happen to have uh, in town, through Bruce's uh, sponsorship, uh, tell us about what happened this week and what it was all about. Well, you know, I was here with a group of, of folks uh, representing the first international drone racing championships that we are hoping to bring to Oahu. Uh, in October, mid-October of next year, uh, we, were, we were initially over on the island of Lanai, and we were looking at various sites there. And then on Tuesday and Wednesday this week, we were uh, looking, we were out at uh, Kualoa Ranch, and we were looking at the, how we could use that to, uh, to create the races and to create the interest in the drone industry from so the racing perspective. So drone racing is really the top end of the whole business, isn't it? I mean, that's extreme performance, extreme hand-eye coordination. Everything's extreme in that game. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, we actually had, the, the truth is we had, you know, many of the world's greatest uh, pilots uh, with us as we, as we explored these various possible venues. Um, Scott Refsland was the one that he's a he's a PhD from from Berkeley, wonderful person. Has really kind of led the charge on creating, creating the drone racing championships. We held the uh, very first um, United States drone racing championships in in Sacramento uh, in July. I'm from Sacramento, and uh, I started at that point. I started through the AUVSI, the Silicon Valley chapter, working with Scott to. To try to help develop, uh, try to help develop the the, uh, the drone racing systems, and so that's really why we came to Hawaii for this week to see, make sure we could uh, create a, a venue that w that would work uh, for the drone racers, and as as importantly, to introduce it to the to the state of Hawaii, uh, and hopefully attain some really nice partnerships. 
So why, uh, just a question. So why Hawaii? Uh, all the way from California to the middle of the Pacific, uh, the string of islands, what are the advantages to, to really uh, do a, a, a UAV drone uh, contest in Hawaii? What, what does Well, there's, what does there's, there's, there's one very simple one word answer to that question, and the answer to that is Hawaii. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, the venues here are just are staggering, and, right. and of course we were out there at uh, Kualoa Ranch, and we were racing up and down those mountains and a, a, across that valley. And, and it, you know, as you all both know, you both live here. I don't, um, but the, you know, just the, the, the vistas are, are staggering, and and so we hope to do something that's very unusual, something that that really has broad appeal. We hope to be, um, we hope to be televising this thing internationally. Uh, we'll live stream it. So I mean that you know Hawaii is just a great place to be. It's in the middle of the Pacific, as you as we all know. Uh, we can we can draw from the mainland. We can draw from Asia. We can right. draw from Australia. So it's just sort of a central point for all of us. Right. Right. And the thing that I found interesting, and having not having seen drone racing before, although a practitioner in the drone technology for a long time, uh, was the the intense level of. Uh, awareness and appreciation and understanding that the, that the drone operators had through the visual connection with the system, through the goggles, instead of looking at a screen or instead of looking up in the sky at something. So the whole issue of making decisions in a rapid, dynamic, changing environment, which is what racing's all about, it really was instructive for me to see. Plus, the level of technology margins built into those systems so they can handle uh, high-impact crashes without being much more than a bent propeller. And the performance margins they have to handle the updrafts and the downdrafts we have here and to handle the rapid changes in, in flight trajectory, it struck me that that level of capability, both at the human side and the technical side, is useful in the world of disaster operations. We're dealing today in disaster operations with relatively mundane, low-powered, low-margin systems that kind of drag their way through the sky. Uh, this whole, what you showed us this week, changes. I haven't figured out how it changes my thinking yet, but it is going to change my thinking about how we approach disaster operations, disaster management. Well, and, go ahead. Well, Ray and I were talking about that just, just yesterday, Ray. So why don't you, why don't you just kind of talk well, about how you see that? Well, we, um, Bruce and I were talking about, and, and it all kind of, uh, comes out of, um, you know, the hobbyists, you know, the, the, the crowds, the, the people who are the first adopters and innovators and so forth. And how to harness that power of so many people out there going to be developing skills and flying these uh, UAVs. And uh, but at the same time, uh, trying to come up with uh, a way of certification or education or training to connect them to emergency management and the needs for IC, the incident command people, and, and what kind of visual uh, imagery they need uh, of, of an incident or event and so forth. So there's, the, uh, cr uh, there's a growing number of people who are going to be in this uh, game or in this uh, sport and so forth. And that's, uh, that's great, but how to get them identified as uh, the local uh, you know, people in a certain part of an of a island or city that, ca that can be uh, kind of like an army, kind of like going in there uh, after a, a natural disaster and uh, becoming the eyes and ears literally in the sky for uh, the early responders, uh, the emergency uh, managers. So what you're saying is that the racing motive will generate a lot of interest and a lot of capability and equipment that people have experience and training. And that could be put to use in the disaster management operations if we could properly harness it, right. manage it, control it, keep it going positive where it makes sense and keep it out of where it doesn't make sense. You wouldn't want the people to become the, the right. first responders to become the first victims. <laughs> of course. So we have to be careful about that. Yeah. But, but they're uh, out there with the technology. They would know more uh, about it. And, um, and also to uh, connect them in a way so that they get certified. What are the needs of incident command? Uh, th that's not being translated to people on the ground and, and coming back to them. So uh, sometimes incident command really don't know the technology also, what's out there and what can be delivered back in imagery. So there's an uh, so inter interactive uh, uh, kind of uh, interaction there uh, that has to take place. And uh, I, I see a great like a crowdsourcing kind of uh, kind of project in the future, and to make two two camps that are right now disconnected uh, come together and really help out. 
you know, and we're leaving Bruce out of the conversation. You're just no, no, Ray and I no, talking that, right no, now. No, 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 that's what, what I, you know, just following up with what Ray said. Uh, the, in my mind, again, the performance margins we saw in the racing systems you guys showed, the performance margins are so extreme that you can handle 25, 30 knot winds without even thinking about it. You could probably handle 50 knot winds. And if we don't make our disaster systems tolerant to 50 knot winds, they're not useful. Plus, with all that performance margin you had, uh, you have the, uh, the ability to operate with very precise uh, positioning and handling. And when we're dealing with uh, search and rescue or dealing with identification of individuals or something, that level of precision may be needed. Also, to get inside trees and, and around structures and things, that level of precision is necessary. So what we saw, I think, has a technical level, a whole state change above what we've normally used to in terms of the ability to get in there and get the job done. So how this can be put to use, and, and uh, Ray mentioned the, the uh, Incident Command Center. We we're so decentral, or so centralized how we operate uh, incident management that we don't allow that front end to have all that information and that rapid development. We have to think of a whole new way to handle EOC operations in order to take advantage of Well, in, in, in some by. ways, it's, it, you almost need a 180 degree exactly. reversal. Um, but you know what, what I was saying, saying to Ray yesterday is the, the, thing, the, the innovation that's going to come out of this technology is really, you can only describe it as profound. Uh, and nobody really knows which direction it will go, or no one knows precisely what will come from that. But as I was suggesting to Ray yesterday, look, looking, at, looking at disaster relief, you know, it would be possible as a, for instance, for, to, to have almost a, you know, as, as Ray was saying, a, an army of, of drone pilots that are located throughout the community. They're all registered with the community that, that serve to a, to a certain extent as, as an immediate response team, they're volunteers, you know where they are in the community, and at any given point, you could, you could put literally hundreds of these things into the air simultaneously, going to where they needed to go, whether it's in a local neighborhood or wherever it may be, that can give you instantaneous feedback as to whatever problems you may have on the ground. And I think that that's something that needs to be uh, truly deeply explored um, and I think people would become engaged with that to have the ability to really, uh, really help their communities. You know, I wonder if we could consider tying something like that together as sort of a civil give back with the actual oh, sure. racing event next year. Oh, Can sure. Oh, absolutely. A, another a half a day or something set aside for HADR or disaster operations in conjunction with? Oh, oh, sure. I think I think that can be done. But you know, you know, another another example. You you as you walk down the beach in Waikiki, you see these. You know, you see your lifeguard stand. You see people out there in the surf. But the truth of the matter is, if they saw something, if a lifeguard saw something out there in the surf, and they needed to get to somebody that was in in distress, they could throw a throw a a, a drone out there and drop a safety vest in 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 seconds. Whereas it might take you know too many minutes to get to that person. So so the that that's a very limited search and rescue, but that's that's a very important one, that's a, one which which can be adopted. And the performance margins, I'll say it again, that you guys showed yesterday, these extremely high performance systems have the ability to get out there very fast, oh, get the do. information and get back, and then with that performance margin, slow it down but carry that life vest sure. out there. I mean that's sure. that little system has a lot of potential. Well the ones we're looking you know, as as you as you know, uh, Ted, the ones we were looking at, they're about the size of a dinner plate, but they <laughs> But they, they, they can travel somewhere between, a, uh, between 80 and 120 miles an hour. I mean, these things are fast. Yeah, right. no I mean, kidding. they are extremely oh, fast. It's like buzzing bees. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are like bees. Uh, but, but so the opportunities that are there are really going to take the collective thinking of people to solve problems that we don't even know exist. But until we force, until, until we allow that, uh, allow that technology to seep into to our to the mental infrastructure of our country and the state of Hawaii in particular, uh, that, that's not going to happen. So we need to, to do what we can to foster that growth. And let's talk about, after the first break here, let's talk about how we might attach that as a sort of a submission and an additional day to the racing. I'd love to, to make we can that, do that Okay. We'll get you back in uh, one minute, folks. Aloha. My name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders 
from across all the spectrum of health in our state, or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us and thanks for supporting us. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and I host Sustainable Hawaii every Tuesday from 11 a.m. to 12 noon. My guests offer insights on challenging economic and environmental issues facing our state and offer innovative solutions to increasing Hawaii's long-term sustainability. Recently, we've been focusing on sustainable land development, food, and energy security. If you have a project or issue you'd like to discuss on the show or would like to be a guest, please contact me at kirstenbturner at gmail.com and tune in live weekly or view the show at your convenience at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Yeah, like, oh, We're back okay. live, folks, Friday afternoon, downtown Honolulu. Ted Ralston with a really activated team here uh, talking about uh, every possible dimension of drone operations and applications in the break. And as I've told Bruce, who's on the show for the first time uh, today, we typically this show ends formally, and then 45 minutes later it actually ends after all the discussions have been done because we think of so many things that we could have said if we, if we had more time. Anyway, we're welcoming in Bruce Parks from uh, the Sacramento uh, unit of AVUSI, and uh, he's here um, assisting in the site selection of uh, a site for next year's October 2016 International Drone Racing, drone racing, racing Competition. I have a question. Uh, you, you, you're emphasizing uh, that you're part of the Silicon Valley uh, chapter, right? Right, yeah. that's correct. So uh, what makes being a UAV uh, club or association based in Silicon Valley different from other clubs? I mean, uh, is there a synergy with the high-tech companies there, uh, uh, with the uh, Googles and Yahoos and uh, so forth? Uh, what, what's so uh, unique and, and uh, you can, uh, are there any other uh, best practices or uh, takeaways for Hawaii? Well, you know, Silicon Valley is, is Silicon Valley. I mean, you, you know, when you're in the midst of it, it, you know, there's just a certain spark there. There's a certain electricity that, that, that I, I don't know uh, exactly that that can be duplicated, but certainly the technology uh, that's there can certainly be transported. There are so many areas within the uh, UAV industry or unmanned aerial vehicle industry uh, that can be grown. Um, across the boards and, 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 and the nice thing about the with the communications we have today it's not limited to Silicon Valley anybody can 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 help foster that and we're hoping that uh, the drone race international next year will help help to foster that it will, it will give people you know a different look at the industry you know people think of drones and they you know they think of you know armed drones they think of warfare and so forth and you know this is when you when you take a look at it from this perspective of a, of a race it's, it's, it's a completely different thing. You see them as, as fun, and, and you know, all we're doing is what humans have always done, no matter what it is, we're interested in speed. You know, we want to race, whether, whether we're racing carts or we're running miles or whatever, there's something about inherent in, in human nature. Uh, that people want to race, and, and so we're gonna, we're going to race these drones out here in Hawaii. And I think uh, a race, um, you know, in Hawaii will be a great venue to uh, bring... We may have a technical difficulty oh. here momentarily, folks. I think Bruce, you oh. may have lost your mic. You may have... Hi, my name is Cindy Matsuki, and I host the show High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. This is the show where we talk about all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing, because there's so many things going on in Hawaii, and more people should know about them. So this is the program that you can come and find out about all the things happening in Hawaii. And this show also airs on Level 54, along with Think Tech Hawaii. And it broadcasts live every, every other Tuesday at 3 p.m. So don't forget, check out the show Tuesday, 3 p.m. every other week. High growth with HTDC. Thanks. How's it? I'm Damon. I'm Joe. And we're the Lola Brothers. We are the Lola Brothers. We are the Lola Brothers. Hey, join us each week where we'll have wacky animations and adventures, and you'll get to hang out with one of our amazing friends. We'll talk about music and... What Life else? in general. Life in general. All right. Current events. Current events. Technology. You can tweet us at ThinkTechHI. Tweet us. We enjoy and, it. And uh, every Thursday is at 5 o'clock. Thursday. Join us. 5. Hello. Ha. Huh? How you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on ThinkTech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, 
Gordo the Texar, and Andrew the security guy, every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech, and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Aloha! Back here Friday afternoon, folks, downtown Honolulu for the last segment of our show. That was a bit of a surprise we had here. Actually, we ran a test on the technical staff here in the studio to see if they could uh, diagnose a problem we had created, and they successfully did it, and we're now back online. So once again, we have Bruce Parks from Sacramento and Ray Tsuchiyama from right down the street in Indy PTC and the uh, incredible conversations going on regarding the value of not just drones, but drone racing, which is, and by the way, I must say that the word drone racing really understates what drone racing is all about. It is the, it is the nexus of technology, communications, um, intelligence, motivation, uh, and miniaturization, and good uh, attention to the engineering that makes this all work. It is like the Indy 500. It, 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 it is that. I mean, Indy 500 is the nexus of everything that makes a car work. And the same thing is true here in what you showed us yesterday. Well, that, that, that's absolutely correct. And I think the industry will, will, will use a lot of the technology and use right. a lot of the measurements uh, for the drone industry as, as NASCAR has been used to develop exactly. the automotive industry. Right. And they'll, they'll follow the same track because the, what, what comes from that testing is innovation. What's, and what works passes through your filter. If it doesn't right. work, exactly. it's not going to get there. Side, and it's thrown yeah. aside quickly because you're so racing. You want you the can next be seen greatest. as a test track for the stuff we need for NDPTC and disaster operations. Right. So we ought to load him up and his team with all the kind of the, the, oper the requirements we've observed, what people have told us they need and such, and just have you your team reflect on these. And then maybe we can find areas where uh, in your kit bag there are solutions that, 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 that move in that direction. The other thing, since you couldn't handle that one, <laughs> was uh, what we were talking about at break time, and that was the, the incredible intensity of personal motivation and ability to respond that I saw in, in that gang. That would rub off on people here a lot when we have uh, demonstrations and such, because we saw Silicon Valley on the road. We saw uh, flying all day long, and then as soon as people got to the houses for the for evening, the dinner table became their repair shop. Yes. And all night long with pizza and Pepsi powering it, stuff yep. happened and things could change, different configurations emerged, the next day ready to go again. Right. And I don't think any of those guys in that team, in your entire team, understand the phrase, cannot do. No, I don't they think don't. they don't get, I don't think they, they get don't. that concept. They don't, they don't. And, and, and yet they're, uh, and if we could rub that off, on anybody we can rub it off on and, and have that one of the learned or trained attributes that goes forward from this, that would be in itself valuable, let alone the drone piece. The ability to solve a problem and get something done and not take no for an answer. Well, that, that's, that's true, Ted. And you know, once people see it and, and experience it, it, it has its own magnetism, its own dynamism to it. You know, yesterday there was a, a woman out from uh, one of the local Honolulu television stations. Uh, and, and I have to tell you, as soon as I put that set of goggles, what they call forward position view goggles, on her, she, she, was, she was just energized. She could see something that she had never literally seen before in her life. And, and once people see that, once they understand it, it's, there is a, a mental paradigm shift as to what's possible. And that would fit in the world of disaster operations. I think That's goggle right. operations in some way would fit that, that need very well in terms of rapid action and response teams and such. Not only does it give you a, a source of bringing information, it also provides a source of protection. That's absolutely right. And I think uh, what's happening is uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle are coming together. Um, uh, what Bruce was talking about, and also um, this be more application of virtual reality to you know to flying, and I think that's like uh, and it has an offshoot from gaming, or, or and they may have another application back to gaming and back to um, all sorts of other applications, and I think uh, what Bruce is talking about is passion. You know, people are really passionate about uh, UAVs and drones, and uh, a lot of things will, a lot of new applications or innovations will come serendipitously. I mean. You, you, you want to solve a problem uh, when the, the, the drone goes down or whatever. And in solving the problem, you, you uh, develop a innovation. And I think that's going to come about. And I think that a venue like, uh, like the racing is, is, a, 
is a great event that really, you know, ninety percent of the work getting there is uh, will really have future applications, especially in disaster uh, recovery, because it's all about uh, trying to find people. You know, disasters are all about uh, mitigating uh, 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 injury and death uh, uh, in populations. So, how do you find people faster? Get them to um, uh, medical uh, treatment faster. Uh, how to locate or do damage assessment so that we can have uh, housing back uh, uh, for families to live in. All sorts of things will uh, will come into play, and I think it's it's a, a blending of not only aerodynamics but also with uh, photography and imaging and getting that information back to emergency responders. Well, let and me managers. give one yeah. example. And you guys did this yesterday out at Kualoa. They uh, invented the subject or the the, the sport of uh, drone cliff diving. <laughs> And right. this, this was a, a competition element, but what they did is they, they stayed right 10 feet high above the, above the train, but the train's going vertical. So right. they basically climbed up the, the right. side of the valley and then came down through the, the flutes in the valley Correct. At, at pretty high speed, toboggan speed. Yes. And uh, what struck me is that uh, when we do search and rescue out here, we, with all the vertical mountains and the sheer cliffs and such, it's very difficult to see what's inside those flutes. Right. But, one of these, just one of the little guys you had yesterday with one battery charge could probably hit three flutes, one up, one down, and one up yes. in, in one battery charge. Yes. And we could get information we have never seen before. Correct. Now, we can turn search and recovery, which is what we call it out here, to search and rescue, because you might get that information fast enough to go get that guy before he becomes, well, he's still a, re still a rescue before he becomes a recovery. Right. So uh, right there, I saw something that would be immediately transferable with some interesting engineering to uh, uh, to the work we're doing in the NBDC. Yeah, well, I have to oh. say that that was fun. Uh, <laughs> just, just strictly from the fun side, I mean, again, you, you have to see these guys. Uh, they're such exquisite pilots of these aircraft. But, but to see those things screaming up the finger of one of those mountains, getting the very top, spinning around, and then shooting down that that channel uh, at, at 100 miles an hour plus, it's just, it, you just go, wow, that's, and, you know, that's and he's really something to see. Probably 10 feet off the surface the whole way, right. which means you're going right. to pick up down to a quarter centimeter right. of what's in there with a the camera. Right. Now right. you combine that with uh, uh, high rate feature extraction like our friends at Oceanet have right down the street who can look at the video at 10,000 frames per second and pick out features. Right. You have the immediate ability to get uh, computerized analysis to give you clues as to where there is perhaps something, especially if you put infrared in there and you pick up the heat signature. So there's d development beyond, but you showed us the starting point. And, and to me, it, it's just a, a, a game-changing uh, perspective in so many ways. So uh, talking as we were talking at, at the last break about how to conduct or create a, a uh, community-based event that attaches to the racing as a component of next year's activity. I just think it would be, if we could pull that off, even if it's just a virtual the first time where we get people together, we don't actually fly, but talk about how we might fly and how, how your flyers with your equipment would solve the problem versus how we solve it with our conventional approaches would be instructive and it would bring us all together. I, I, I think that what's interesting about the about the industry in general and, and racing perhaps uh, even more particularly so is that the that there it's it's a true collaboration I mean these guys are competitors I mean they really are competitors but there's a a, a camaraderie uh, among them that you really can't describe unless you see it and the, and the, it's and it, and it is collaborative I mean they will sit down and help a competitor fix his aircraft they, they will talk to them about how they fix this or fix that, even though, you know, an hour later they'll be out racing against one another. They, they, it, it, it's, it's more the spirit of it. And, and that's what people have got to understand. They've really got to see the opportunity that this technology uh, presents and also to see it from the perspective that, that the solutions are different than they have been in the past. It's not, it's not top-down solutions. It's, it's as bottom-up as you can get. It's, it's solving problems immediately and and for me at least personally all of this said and done the important thing is that it opens doors to the educational community from from little kids to adults 
because they are going to go in there and they are going to start to problem solve. You, they might not be interested in learning math, they might not be interested in learning science, but they'll be interested in learning what it is that they have to do in order to make that drone fly faster, and that is science and math, and, and I like to call it smart science, math, art, uh, research and technology, so you get smart kids. And, and the, one of the important parts is, is the art piece. It is something that people can see differently. They might not be good at science or math, but they can think differently. They can see solutions from the technology that presents itself. And, and I think that that's critical to developing uh, the, the skill sets of our young people and not leaving somebody out because they may not be good in a particular uh, field of endeavor. Amen. And by way of advertising, what we're talking about here is, is getting rid of the term STEM and even STEAM, which came later, which added the A to it, the arts, and make it into SMART. And you smart. invented that last Friday. That's the first time <laughs> well, I heard I, it. Well, I thought of it Saturday, a while back. Right? I'm so, not sure I invented so it, but folks, I thought it's it. SMART, not STEM. It's uh, <laughs> yeah. science, math, arts. We all want smart arts, kids, right? <laughs> research <laughs> and technology. And, uh, and the arts part is, is, uh, is so essential. I mean, expressiveness is art. Understanding how to do something with what you got is art. That, that doesn't normally fit in the, in the STEM uh, construct. Well, it... And, it and oh, yeah, if I can say from an engineering perspective, everything that we in engineering and technology have was basically swiped from the arts prior to. Right. That is the terms uh, force, the terms energy, power, those kind of things which we have specific calculations on in engineering were actually swiped from a metaphysical narrative in the days gone by when they had some meaning, but it wasn't clear what they meant. It had some human-oriented, uh, art-oriented meaning. And scientists took those and said, that's a good idea. We'll just put some numbers on it and tell you how to calculate it. Right. And uh, so we, we then believe that that is where it starts and ends, at the calculation level. No, it that has doesn't. a significance beyond just that. And I think that's what the art aspect is so important here. Well, it and is. And, you know, it really dawned on me when I, when I took one of these small vehicles and I, and I just held it in my hand. And again, they're only about, you know, a foot across or thereabouts. And I, and I looked at it and I thought to myself, you know, what's here it is science and it is math and it is technology, but you look at that and you can see the art in, in creating that. And to tell you the truth, I mean, that's what Steve Jobs was about to a large extent. I mean, what he did is he, he took art and he converted it into technology. And I mean, th that's the opportunity for people to really, really be able to collaborate and bring these, well, you these know, various thought processes together. Samuel Morse, the guy who invented the Morse code 500 years ago, he was an artist, he was a painter. And he went down to the Baltimore Sun uh, newspaper and looked at the job cases and found that the distribution of letters that Baltimore Sun had was not anywhere near linear. It was a lot of E's and there weren't very many Z's. And he began thinking, hey, maybe the language is expressible in some way other than just in the letters we have, and that's where the Morse code came from. So anyway, uh, on and on and we go. But engineers, <laughs> well, you know, engineers uh, can, copy can I, artists. Right, right. If I can kind of uh, go back to so, Hawaii. Yes. And, okay. and, uh, one, uh, I'm trying to, you know, see ways to promote Hawaii, and and I, I think uh, drone racing uh, in the future uh, uh, should be connected with tourism in some way. The tourist um, industry that we have uh, over overwhelmingly part of our economy, and I think if they, uh, the major hotels and and, and tourism. Uh, industry look look at this as not uh, irritant in Waikiki, but right. rather make it a drone friendly place right. uh, that attracts even more tourists uh, to spend more money and make uh, more things here, and and even settle down and and um, establish and launch uh, drone companies. Right. Uh, that's where I want to go with this, uh, and and have applications that uh, range from design to education, and of course disaster management. But in all fields uh, that we export and. Uh, these apps and, and drones uh, to Asia Pacific and uh, create jobs for young people. That, that's what that's I'm trying what to go it's with. About. It. I'm trying to go with this. Well, and, you're, yeah. and you're right, Ray. I mean, you, yeah. you, you know, you, you, both you and Ted have worked with the folks in, in Alaska, and, and you, you see what they've oh, done yeah. up there in Alaska, and the same thing can be, had, right. can be true here in Hawaii. But it, what it takes is vision. It takes somebody understanding it and helping to foster it. And I think that that's what. Uh, you're both about. You know, I, th I want to add one more clarification on terminology here. Um, um, I'll, I'll be the sedentary one. Um, uh, the term drone has fallen into our laps, not that we wanted to, it just got there. And it, it, right. it your, your washing machine at home is a drone. You put some clothes right. in, you <laughs> dials, set Very some dials, good. and yeah, later on right. yeah. that evening the wash yeah. is done. You know, that's a drone. 
uh, your watering system in your yard is a drone. You, it, at a certain time, it goes on and then does a bunch of banks of watering. These things are unmanned vehicles, and they're intensely piloted. They aren't unpiloted by any, say, any sense, stretch of imagination. They're intensely piloted oh, by right, really... That's right. Well, the racers is, are. Right. The racers and, are. And uh, uh, that's true, really, from pretty much all of the systems that are out there. There's less intensity, perhaps, in, a, in the mundane agricultural operations. But the point is that to the public that these things are piloted. They are absolutely piloted. They're not just on their own out there. Well, that's not absolutely correct, Ted. I mean, I mean, what okay. you're seeing, what you're seeing in the in the industry is is the ability and the in the the search to make these things truly autonomous. So, so they are. Many right. companies are making these autonomous right. drones so that they can go out in the field. You can program it to run a grid pattern across, uh, uh, you know, uh, an agricultural field. That's the Google car. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's right. Um, but but they are they're autonomous, so they're they're not. I mean, the racers are certainly piloted, but I think what you're going to see with the industry is that they will increasingly move to autonomous operation, which isn't to say there will not be a need for piloted operations, but you're going to see a big, a, a big, pre big pressure on creating autonomous vehicles. Well, I think that's right. I think what I was kind of getting at was that the uh, autonomy will take place in the specific vehicle operation and the, and the design of the mission, but the, the the, the human will still have supervisory uh, involvement here and, oh, sure. uh, and a lot of, in, in, in fact, an increasing ability to see the mission in its whole self as opposed to dealing with the, the vehicle by itself. Right. So the human will have actually a higher role in operating these systems because they'll be using mission objectives as the driver more so than, than piloting terms. Correct. Uh, but in, in any case, the, whether it's the racers done by an intense human piloting or a mission being performed by a uh, a lot of autonomy with overall human ins uh, insight. It's the it's the computational intelligence and the uh, uh, and the ability to make decisions on board rapidly based on a range of sensors that are going to be coming into the game as time goes on. And it'd be really cool to see that actually. It could that could be extracted from the racing business. The racing oh, sure. business may be the very one, the first one, it because will. if we can take five seconds off a guy's lap time by giving him a little more autonomy, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> How long will it take to him to adopt that? Right, Not very well, long. You know, I I I kind of look at uh, drones for a lot of people, sort of the gateway drug. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's it's something that that, yeah. that once you see it and you start to play with it, man, you just you know you just can't. It's the nickel you bag. Can't, you, <laughs> can, you can't you can't get enough of it, and and of course that naturally segues over to the development of, of other either land based or water based. Uh, uh, Robots is what they are. I mean, they whether they're operating on the surface or where they're operating, they're robots, and and um, this is just a segment of that robotic uh, robotic systems. Let me make a, 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 a public service announcement on behalf of the FAA, and then also take us back to the sort of things that AVUSI is interested in, and I can tie them together and reach right back into what we're talking about. Just I just had a meeting with the FAA this afternoon here in town. I just want to point out to folks who might have recently received a 333 exemption or a COA or some other means allowing them to use drones in, uh, in commercial work. Some of the exemptions apparently are being developed by just copying from exemptions that other people already have spent money on to get going. And sometimes they're copied wrong. Oh. And, and, uh, and as a result, the, uh, some of the exemptions, although have, they've been issued, aren't usable in the way the people had intended, and they have to go back and do an amendment to get them fixed. It fundamentally, uh, in the area that's been recently discovered is that of, of congested areas. Mm -hmm. uh, the rules of, of operation in congested areas have large setbacks in terms of lateral distance and altitude of which you can operate. And if you don't ask for an exemption from the most uh, stringent of the, uh, of the congested area uh, rules, then you're stuck with the conventional uh, operation, which means you have to remain 1,000 feet above and 1,500 feet laterally from an area. If you're a wedding photographer, that isn't going to be a really cool thing to do unless you want to take a picture of the right. whole Pacific Ocean. Right. And the, I think the essential misunderstanding is by the people who've been f filing for these exemptions is congested area is an FAA formal definition. Right. And it's right here on the, if you can focus in on the chart here, it's right here on the chart. Anything in yellow is defined as a congested area on the uh, sectional oh. chart. And so that uh, if you don't have your 
exemption written with knowledge of that, you're going to write it wrong. Right. Oh. So the FAA has said, hey, folks, uh, review your, your exemptions uh, very carefully. And in fact, any ones that are here in Hawaii, the FAA FISDO will be, light, will be more than happy to sit down with you and read exactly what the exemption says so you know exactly what your limitations are. And you can figure out what you have to do for your First Amendment because there's going to be a right. lot of amendments right. written on these. Right. So that's our public service announcement. I also, oh, um, and we do have to think about how to take the uh, emerging rapidly and potentially more autonomous racing function and, and find a way to make that covered in the, in the rules as well as, that, as time goes on here. So I just want to point that out to you that we'll have to maybe well, take your experience of Sacramento. Well, that, you know, that, that's really, there. I mean, it is covered by the FIA, but, it, but it's, it's covered in such a way as through the AMA uh, Hobbyist Association so that once the AMA certifies as they have certified these racers, then they automatically are sanctioned by the FAA. So we're, we're flying, you know, th these aircraft are flying at, at less than 50 feet, typically, <laughs> off the surface. Less than 10 feet, I would say. Well, <laughs> sometimes, yes. Um, so so they're, they, they're not really, they don't in any way uh, impose or create a hazard in the, in the national airspace, by and large. So we just have to bring that forward you know, early right. up, up right. front so we don't have any issues in it downstream. So we, we're going to be guaranteed we're going to be talking in the hallway for a long time here because this is exciting stuff and uh, it's, it's great to have you on the show, Bruce, for the well, first I'm, time. I, I'm delighted to know, be we, come we, back to We Hawaii do have Skype and we'd like to, or we can bring you in by Skype and All right, other okay. folks who want to be we, part we of this. We had Skype uh, with Ted in Alaska. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, Alaska. yeah. yeah that, that we did that. Yeah. And, uh, and Ray, uh, thank you again for coming on the show and talking about this thing we only have the tip of the iceberg that oh, we hit here today. It's just the beginning of a, of a fantastic uh, a revolution. In, in it is a revolution. So let me ask, as we always do on this show, for you, Bruce, as our first guest, to uh, tell the people what you'd like them to take away from this conversation so they can be ready for the next one. Well, I think what I'd like people to take away with is to take away is, is the to have a real close look at, at the tremendous innovation that's going to come from the use of drones. Uh, and also to really understand what it does in creating jobs, what it does in, is in, in, in really adding to the educational value of our young people. I think, for me at least, that that's one of the most important factors uh, that exist. It's, like I said earlier, it's a gateway drug for people that they really learn how to innovate, to think differently, and to solve problems, and I think that's important. And Ray? I think uh, our takeaway is this race that's coming up. Uh, we have some time to really build momentum in the community and bring uh, uh, people uh, from um, you know all all corners of society in police, fire, education, uh, disaster management, all kinds of people to see what's happening and they literally watch what's what's uh, uh, these uh, UAVs can do. And I think that will be a sea change. It, it'll be, it's slow, but I think we have some time to getting, again, the tourism industry, the hotels and so forth, to not look at this as a irrit irritant, but a uh, part of the tidal wave of tourism. It may be UAV tourism coming to Hawaii, because as uh, why, why did uh, Bruce and this great uh, group of uh, uh, of professionals uh, come to Hawaii. There's a reason for that. Listen. It's the most beautiful place in the world to take uh, imagery and, of course, an exciting place to race. Okay. And I'd like to say, for my takeaway, that we need to take the, ob the objectives and the things we're thinking about in, in disaster management and, and public safety and bring them into the view window here in the racing area, tie the two together, and do this half day or something uh, uh, exercise okay. of some kind yeah. that brings the two communities together and we'll extrapolate what we can from the racers into the, into the operations and let the racers understand what the operational needs are so we can do a better job uh, one year after the other. Yep. And gentlemen, I thank you very much All for right, coming thank on. thank you, Ted. Thanks for inviting Bruce, me. Bruce, thank you. Ray, always a pleasure. Uh, Bruce, again. Thanks a lot, Ray. It's a real <laughs> pleasure. And, and folks, with that, that, we'll close our show, and we'll see you uh, next week. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>